Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to our Stoughton campus, our Hennett campus. Good morning to those watching on our I campus today. Um, open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. We're starting a new series called Shift. Uh, how many of you, um, in, you know, I, I won't be able to see you at the campus, but raise your hand. How, how many of you uh, know how to drive a stick shift? Let me see your hands. Okay. That is a fading art. Um, we, uh, we have a bus, uh, we have a, we have a bus and we have a shuttle bus. The shuttle bus needs a new engine. Um, like the head at campus had a shuttle bus. Anyway, that's automatic, but our bus bus, it, it's a stick shift. And so, uh, when I went to get my driver, my license, my CDL license for the bus, the lady who does this every day for a living, who does the testing, right? She, uh, like you have a stick shift. I said, yes. She goes, I haven't seen one of those in years. It's like, very funny. Anyway, um, so the idea of a shift, if you don't come out of a, if you don't know how to drive a stick shift, it, 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 the principle applies, but it's going to be a little different for those who, of us grew up driving stick shifts, right? Because we understand that, you know, the, in, in an automatic, you have the same gears, it just functions differently, right? But you have first gear, and you go in second gear, right? And you hit the clutch, and then you go into third gear, and you hit the clutch, you go into fourth gear. And if you're in fourth gear, and then, like, if you're like me, there used to be, I remember before, well, I remember when there was only three gears, because there was three in the tree. Remember three in the tree? Who knows three in the tree, right? Who has no idea what three in the tree is? Okay. Instead of the shift that being four in the floor, are you tracking? Three in the tree was up here in the steering column. There was only three, right? You had, well, you had reverse. You had first gear, second gear, third gear, but it was up in the tree. It was in the steering column, and then they went really cool with four in the floor because that was awesome, okay? Anyway, because then you could have, rest your hand on it, like, you know, because that's what you did. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. Memories. Okay, anyway, so <laughs> you drive. And then, uh, and then I remember before there was a fifth gear, you know, because fifth gear was like overdrive. That was like when you get on the highway. That's how it was explained. Okay, you're driving in town, you're in fourth gear. But when you get ready to get on the highway and really get her going to save some gas mileage, drop her, you, you want to shift into fifth gear, right? Fifth gear didn't have the same punch. So if you want to pass somebody, you couldn't just narrowly, you couldn't just narrow, you know, hit it and go. You just had to go into fourth gear to get a little juice back in your engine to do that. Well, anyway, so if you're driving in fourth gear, let's say, and you're just driving down and you say you want to pass somebody or whatever happens, sometimes you had to downshift in the third gear, not because you wanted to slow down, because you really wanted to accelerate and you wanted the power of doing that, right? So life is much that way. Sometimes we have to shift. And we're, sometimes we're, you know, we're in overdrive. Sometimes we're just cruising along the highway and we're just kind of doing things. And other times we need a little power. Maybe we're going up a hill. You're going up a hill. You're going to have to downshift to have the power to make up the hill. You're going down a hill. You, you downshift to slow yourself down a little bit. There's all kinds of reasons that we shift in life. Just like if you've driven a car that had gears, you did the same thing. So we're going to talk about shifts um, in the next few weeks. Uh, today's shift is shift your focus, mission, and vision. We're talking about shifting your focus, mission, and vision. Let me read this passage to you. And really, this passage is where the entire thing is going to come from. Um, Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Jesus went through all the towns and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Let's we'll stop there for a second. Now, I'm going to compare that just for a second. There's one place that didn't happen at. The one place was Nazareth. So like in, you know, in Matthew and Luke, they tell a story of Jesus was teaching and everybody's like, oh my gosh, this guy's amazing. He is awesome. This is like, he, you know, they were, it says they were astonished by his teaching, right? And they'd seen the stuff he had done. And then one of them goes, hey, uh, isn't that the carpenter's boy? Um, isn't that Mary's son? I Me and his dad, Joseph, and then all of a sudden, they got angry at him and wanted to throw him over a cliff. They wanted to get rid of him because they were so upset with him. But it's like they were astonished and amazed until they realized that they knew his parents. And that was just, you know, when I talk about that, that past of Scripture, the enemy just came right in there and took away the faith that they that got. Because Jesus could have done the same thing in Nazareth he did in these other towns. But the problem was the lack of faith, it says that Jesus was not able to do miracles in his own hometown because they 
humanized him. They didn't say, oh my gosh, he is the Messiah. Look at what he says. I mean, they, they'd heard what he said and thought it's amazing, right? They were astonished by his teaching. They heard something about him that was different than everyone else until the whisper of the enemy said, but isn't he Joseph's son? Isn't that Mary's little boy? Like, she wasn't even married when she got pregnant with him. And then they got angry. The difference in this passage that I'm getting ready to read, and well, all the other passages we could read, and the passages where that happened in Nazareth was simply the issue of faith. Now, we talk about faith, or, you know, I talk about faith in two kind of concepts, the noun version and the, and the verb version. One's just kind of, I believe that Jesus Christ, Son of God, and raised from the dead, and all that kind of stuff. And you can believe that and believe in those facts, those are factual, I mean, those things you can research and find if they're factual or not, they're facts. The resurrection is a fact, all that kind of stuff. And you believe in the facts about Jesus. That doesn't mean that you have what I call verb faith, the kind of faith that empowers you and transforms you and inspires you and allows God to do the miraculous, his miraculous work in and through you. Because at the end of the day, if you don't have faith to believe, you'll never receive. You'll never see it happen, whatever it is. And so when we sit back in our, well, I'm a realist, or I'm, I'm, I just need to see it. I used to live in Missouri, and Missouri's the show me state. I live in Missouri. I want, I'm a, I want to see it, see it first. Just show me. Okay, dude, that is not how faith operates. Now, I understand why we think that way, right? And there's so many frauds out there, and there's so much abuse and all that kind of stuff. I understand all that. But how the Bible, how, how the Bible describes the Christian life is supposed to operate is that we walk in our relationship with Christ. We're going to Galatians chapter 2. We walk in our relationship with God, with Christ, the same way we received him, by faith. That by faith, we are to walk. Now, what that means is, I don't know what's coming next, because by faith, because if I can see it, then I don't need to have faith. Faith really is based on the fact that I don't know. I just think God said. I think God's stirring. I think God's drawing. I think God's... In, Whatever that thing is, is I'm going to respond to him. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to chase after him, whatever the word is you would use, and I'm going to trust him. That somehow he'll provide, he'll protect, he'll be faithful like he's always done throughout the generations or whatever we're talking about. So in the difference in Nazareth and all the towns was faith. Now, apply that just for us for a second. The difference in the people who see the activity of God in their life on a consistent basis and those who don't is always going to come back to the issue of faith. Not do you believe that he died on the cross and raised from the dead and, you know, that kind of stuff. But active, verb-like, week in and week out faith. That's what it all comes back to. Well, why don't we see God do more things in our world than, than they, we see in the Bible? Well, if you go to places like, let's say, Africa or some kind of third world country, whatever it is, the missionaries there tell of all kinds of miracles being done, crazy, insane stuff being done. Well, why not in America? Well, God's still doing stuff in America. I, I've seen a lot of people be healed. I mean, there's a lot of things that God does in America. But why not like in places like that? This is a topic, lack of faith. I've sat with people who had a disease that would kill them. Okay, let me tell you how how I think. This is kind of a side part to the message, but you understand what I think. Because we like to word faith. There's faith, it's noun, faith, it's verb. Faith, it's verb, I believe is a spiritual gift. The Bible talks about a spiritual gift of faith. Okay, so... Let's say that I was diagnosed with cancer, okay? Something, you know, that would kill me. Um, I either have the faith to believe that God will heal me or I don't. That's how I process it, okay? If I'm praying for someone else, they say, oh, I have a whatever. Uh, would you pray for me that God would heal me? I, I'm going to pray with what I call in accordance to my faith. And which what God gives, not because I have lack of faith. I don't have a lack of faith. It's that I believe that when God wants to do something, it's not because I asked him to. I believe it's because he, he, he wants to, and therefore he stirs my heart to do that. So I'm, my job is to pray in agreement with what God stirred in me, right? That's my job. So I don't mean my job is in my, my job is in what I get paid to do. I mean my job is a follower of Christ. It's all our jobs. So 
when, when, I don't think there's a thing where you just say it enough, pray it enough, and you talk God into something. I don't believe that's true. But I believe that God stirs you to believe something, and then if you're willing to walk it out, to persevere through the process, then God will accomplish the thing he, he said, okay? So whether it's a physical healing or, like in our case, a church that, that grows in a small town, you're not supposed to be able to do that and has multiple campuses and all these other kind of things. If I talk about any of our, I mean, I, I just go through this whole list. These are things when God stirs it, then our job is to walk in it. And if we have faith, God provides, God protects, God takes care of it. If we choose not to have faith, if we choose to have fear and doubt, then James comes in where it says that he who doubts should not expect to receive anything from God because he's unstable, he's double-minded. Double-minded means you say you have faith in me, but when I ask you to walk in faith, you don't walk in faith. That's what that's talking about. So the, the problem here is these, these towns were, that what's going to happen is they were responding to what they saw God, Jesus doing, and Nazareth wasn't willing to because they humanized him. They said, oh, that's, that's Joseph's boy. That's Mary's boy. He's the carpenter's son. Now, many of us may have done exactly the same thing. We've fallen into this routine. It's, it's a version of religion. If we think about religion in the negative sense of the word, rules and legalism, all that kind of stuff, right? There's legalism and that's religion. And there's relationship. And so I have a relationship with Jesus, not a religion. Okay. But then even in those who have a relationship we tend to slide into religion. What that means is, is that really rather than walking in relationship with Jesus, we walk in a relationship with a church or a system of beliefs. We're pretty good people. Why eat church on Sunday morning? Because that's what good people do. Some of you don't raise your hands. Some of you wouldn't be here today if you didn't have children because it's important to you to bring your children to church, but you wouldn't be here if they weren't coming. Why is that? Because you don't have a relationship with Jesus. You have a relationship with religion. I don't mean you're not saved. You can be saved and be religious. You got a relationship with do's and don'ts. I talked to somebody the other day, and they was like, you know, well, I just hope I get to go to heaven. Like, dude, what do you mean you, get, you just hope? Well, in their mind, it's, they think there's this list of do's and don'ts, and they, they think that they, it's a performance thing, right? And if I perform well, I get to go to heaven. If I don't, maybe I, won't make the, maybe I won't make the cut. Not if you know Jesus. A relationship with Christ is based on your, his grace and your faith in him. We're saved by grace through faith, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. You're saved by, by grace through faith. That's it. There is no works in there. And it actually says, not of works so no one can brag about it. You're not saved by your works. If you were raised in some kind of environment, if grandma taught you something, if whatever church where you grew up in taught you that somehow you were saved by works, that is a lie. That is not biblical. That came from hell. That's all about performance and making us feel like we're not good enough or making us feel because we are good enough, we're superior to everyone else who's not good enough. The Bible would say this, none of us are good enough that our good works that are righteous before God are like filthy rags. Not a single person, no matter how perfect they may be. Well, Mother Teresa, she's perfect. Well, no, she's not. If Mother Teresa was saved, I'm not saying she's not, I don't know. I don't know her. But if she's saved, she's saved by grace through faith, not of works. Well, grandma was awesome. I'm sure grandma goes to go right to heaven. No, that's not how that works. Grandma, if she gets to go to heaven, she goes to heaven because she chose to believe in a Savior who offered her amazing, relentless, never-ending grace. Everyone who spends eternity with God in a place called heaven has chosen to receive salvation because they believed in their heart, not in their head, They chose God's grace because no matter how good they are, they're not good enough. Now, that's the facts. So when you look at what, when I talk through this, this series and what we want to see God do in us and what you want to see God do in you and all that kind of stuff, the real question comes back to what do you believe? I mean, are you, are you just a version of religion? 
I mean, if there's really bad legalistic religion, then there's like a tamer version, not quite as legalistic, but still trying to perform and earn God's love religion. And then there's a relationship with a living Savior. See, if you've got a relationship with a living Savior, here, and here's the bottom line. It's like, we, we talk about being followers of Christ. In my lifetime, we went from being Christians to followers of Christ. You know why that happened? Because... Um, because people who call themselves Christians probably aren't even saved a lot of times. Just because you go to church. I mean, there's a lot of churches that if I go by the fruit, if we're going to look at fruit and say, okay, it's a fruit tree. Okay, it's an apple tree because I see apples on it. It's a peach tree. I see peaches on it. If we're going to look at fruit and say, that's that, there's lots of churches filled with lost people. If they're not lost, or at least definitely are grieving and quenching the Holy Spirit. So just because you're quote, a Christian, because you got saved, because you prayed prayers and got baptized does not save you. Those are works. Those are acts of the process. Those are steps in the process, but those aren't salvation. Salvation is by grace, through faith, when the Spirit of God indwells you, and he begins to change you from the inside out. And how you've got to start seeing yourself is you've got to start asking yourself the questions, are you being changed from the inside out? Are you in a process of transformation? That's what you have to ask yourself. It never ends technically. So we're, we're followers of Christ. Now, following Christ means, I mean, the words have definitions, right? It means actually follow Christ. That's what it means. So if I said, hey, I want you to follow me, we're going to go back here someplace. I don't want you to sit there. So if I took a few steps, I turn around and look, I said, follow me, let's go. Right? And you can say, I love Tim. I'm Tim's guy. I, 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 I fully support Tim. Tim is awesome. Right? But if I say, follow me, and I walk this direction, and you don't come with me, you're not a follower. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Okay. So what happens so many times is, is that we're not really followers of Christ. We're followers of a religion. The religion is stagnant. The belief system is stagnant. It, it, let's say it's perfectly accurate. The church is awesome. What we believe is awesome. We say the right things. We believe in grace through faith. We, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's perfect. Never in a bad, better day. The worship is great. The children's ministry is great. The youth ministry is great. The pastor is handsome. Everything's perfect. If you're not actually following Jesus, then you're just following some version of religion. You're going through motions. You're checking off boxes of I did this and I did this and I did this. I go to church. I go to a really good church. My kids love my church. My teenagers love my church. Our Sunday morning services, we feel the presence of God. I love my church. Okay. All that is true, yet none of that means you're actually following Jesus. Following Jesus means you, um, if he asks you to go, you go. If he's working on your life to change something, you allow him. If he's stirring you to respond, you respond. It means you follow Christ. I just don't go to church. Now, how does that happen? So, if you think about like a friend sent a text message, right? Um, when your friend needs something, they send you a message and say, hey, could you help me do this? Then you respond or ignore it, whichever one you want to do. I will, I won't, or you just act like you never saw it, whichever way you go. The Holy Spirit stirs us. That's his job. He stirs us. We respond with yes, no, or act like we didn't hear it. Everybody tracking? So in a service like this, maybe God starts stirring your heart. Maybe he already has. Maybe while he's watching John's story on the screen and watching him be baptized, maybe you're sitting there going, yeah, I haven't fallen through the baptism. I need to do that yet. And then you hear it, you feel it, you sense God stirring you, but yet 
you don't follow through and letting us know and scheduling that because of some other reason in your brain, well, I'm not good enough or I want to take care of this or I want to resolve that or I want to stop doing this or start doing that or whatever reason you'd say. <clears throat> so if the friend texts you and you say, yes, I'll help you, they'll probably text you other times in the future because that's your, your, you say yes. If your friend texts you and you say no consistently, they probably won't text you in the future because they just already know you're going to say no. Right? If your friend texts you and you don't respond, not responding is equal to no, therefore they'll stop texting you because you don't even respond. Is everybody tracking? Okay. So when God wants to do something through you, when Jesus is going to do something in and through you, then he sends you a message through the Holy Spirit. It can happen 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It can happen sitting in church. It can happen sitting on your lawnmower, driving down the highway. It can happen at 2 o'clock in the morning when you think you got woke up to go pee and you head to the bathroom and God starts stirring you. It can happen any time of any day when God wants to speak to you, he stirs you through the Holy Spirit. He can use scripture. He can use people. He can use circumstances. Lots of ways God can do it, but the only way it actually happens is through the Holy Spirit. So you would say, well, God spoke to me through Tim today. Well, how'd that happen? It's the Holy Spirit who actually did all that, not Tim, right? Okay, so when God wants to speak to you, he sends you a message through the Holy Spirit. So just like on my cell phone, I don't know how it works, but whether you're sitting right here, like I see Tanya right now, if Tanya wanted to, she could send me a text message right now and say, hi, Tim, how you doing? I'm listening to a great message by a great preacher. And I could say, well, I don't have my phone on me, so I wouldn't say anything. Anyway, or a person on the other end of the nation, a different country could send me a text message, and boom, and my phone, somehow, it shows up. I don't know how it happens. It's kind of invisible, right? There's no wires attached to it. It just takes place, right? So God says, I want to send you a message. It's really no more miraculous than Tanya sending me a message. God says, I'm going to send you a message. He said, but send me carrying a cell phone in my pocket. He's got his spirit who lives inside of me, and he speaks into me, and he stirs me, and he draws me, and he gives me the, whatever the word is. God does that. Now, when he does that, when he sends me that message, I either say yes, or I say no, or I act like I didn't see it. Everybody tracking? Now, I'm not going to talk about the far away religion, the really religious uh, legalism, you know, that negative stuff. I'm not talking about that because, you no, know, that's not what we deal with. I mean, it's out there, but you're not around here, not what we deal with our church. But we do have some of you, maybe, who have this middle, I call this middle section. You got like some religion in you. And you just want to think that if you come to church, you're pretty good people. And you, but you're, you're insecure about whether you go to heaven or not. You're insecure about whether you're saved or not. You're just not really sure about a lot of things and you're just stuck right here. For whatever reason, you're stuck right here. What I want us all to be is I want us all to have this relationship with Christ where we actually are followers of him. Now, if you're over there, you're falling in one of two categories, okay? Either God doesn't stir you or God stirs you and you don't respond. If God stirs you and you don't respond, I don't know how many times it'll be, but there'll be a day when you've grieved and quenched his spirit enough that he just doesn't mess with you. He done messing with you. If you say, I know Christ my Savior, the only way you know you're saved is the Holy Spirit living in you, right? I know Christ my Savior. I know that I die, I go to heaven. The Holy Spirit lives inside of me. But God never stirs me. God never speaks to me. God never does anything to draw me or convict me. Or I don't have that thing happening inside of me. Okay, then that means you've already grieved and quenched him enough by saying no enough times, and you need to deal with that. Well, how do you deal with that? Well, there's that word called repentance, where you change your mind, change your direction, change your purpose. The Holy Spirit's a person. Just like Jesus is a person, right? If you offend a person, what do you do to a person? Your job is to apologize to a person. You say to the Holy Spirit, oh, Holy Spirit, I am so sorry. You take ownership for what you have said or what you haven't done or whatever the word is. You, you repent. You change your mind. So you can change your direction. So you can change your purpose. You don't have to live a life where God never stirs you. I don't mean like it's like every three minutes. It's not like a, somebody blowing your phone up. You know, you got those text messages people you don't want to mess with you so much. 
Like, dude, there was like 97. Have you ever, I remember when cell phones and we started doing that kind of stuff and it'd be like, you know, the person, do you remember? You know, I remember this. Okay, when we first got cell phones, it was roaming things and stuff like that. People would actually turn their phone off and only use it during an emergency. You didn't have your phone on all the time we do now, right? And then like, so, you know, you, you hardly ever send a text message or anything else. And now like you look at your child's, you know, cell phone bill, and they're like got seven, 13 million, whatever text messages. You're like, how is it possible to send so many text messages in a month? Like, this is the craziest thing ever. Do you ever sleep? How does this happen? I don't understand it, right? Well, we don't necessarily want people to text us all the time. So don't get your head around this and think, well, it never ends. And, you know, it, whether it's once a week or once a month or whatever it is, it's not the point. Just don't think about it in how often it is, as much as, is it happening? Does the Spirit of God engage you? Does he speak in you? Does he stir you? Does he draw you? Does he convict you? Do you walk into an environment sometimes, and all of a sudden you, you see things or feel things or think things, that, how you need to respond? I mean, it's like, now the question, that we, well, I'm not talking about yet that you respond correctly. I'm just saying, did you feel that you should have? Did you feel that you should have done something that you didn't follow through with, that you should have sent a message you didn't send, that you should have invited someone you didn't invite? I mean, you should have volunteered for something you didn't volunteer for. Is God at least stirring you in some way? Because if he's not, I'm just telling you the problem. If you're in relationship with him, based on the, the commitment, uh, the, the closeness of that relationship, I mean, just think about your people you talk to now. Um. There's times you send a text message to somebody. I send a text message to somebody, and I'll say, um, hey, this is Tim. Sometimes I say, hey, this is Tim Rodas. Right? Well, what's the difference? Well, some people just know that I'm Tim. Other people don't know, well, Tim who? They don't even have a clue. And other people, I don't send any kind, I don't, I don't say, like if I was going to send a message to Tanya, I wouldn't say, hey, this is Tim Rodas, blah, 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 blah. I would just send a message, and she would know who I was because it's in her phone. Right? God isn't, he not, you know, he, is he the kind of guy he has to tell you, hey, this is God? Or do you have the kind of relationship where you just know it's him? Well, the difference is how close you walk with him. That's all we're talking about is we're talking about how close we walk. That's it. That's it. Don't make it over more complicated than it needs to be. So if you say to me, God never stirs me, I'm telling you there's a problem. If you say to me that God stirs me sometimes, but I, I tend to ignore him. And, and sometimes we ignore him, not because we're trying to be willfully ignore him. We're just not sure it's him or not. Whatever, okay. Or you're going to tell me that I sense God stirring me and I respond to him all the time on a regular basis. Whatever regular basis means, I see it's a part of my life. And if I had us all stand up and go into three sections, these people over here, if, if you sense God's presence and he stirs you and he convicts you and he encourages you and all whatever the words are, you think God sending you messages and you respond to him, then go over there. If you're in this middle place where sometimes you feel that way, but you don't usually respond to him, you either ignore him or say no, go here. And if you go in the category of, I don't, he doesn't ever do anything. He doesn't stir me. I don't, I don't feel nothing. I don't think anything. I just kind of go through the mode. I go to the church. I do my thing. I'm a good people. I believe the right stuff. But I don't ever feel God doing something in me. Then you'll be over here. It's that simple to put yourself in a category. And every one of you could do that right now. If I just, I'm not going to just relax. If I just said, go, every one of you could get up and go into a section. So mentally, I want you to decide where would you go? Number one, the outline. Shifting your focus allows you to see things differently. Shifting your focus allows you to see things differently. Um, what you focus on tends to get done. What you don't focus on tends to be neglected. Um, we're in basketball season, so I'll use basketball analogy. Um, so as a shooter, if I get the ball in my hands, I'm going to shoot. When I look at the rim, I look at the back of the rim. Okay? 
Uh, and I would say that if you don't look at the back of the room, you probably miss the shot. You're probably going to hit the front of the room. Okay? I look at the back of the room, and I have a certain motion. What I call is up and then out, up, not out, right? Because people who shoot flat like this, they may make the shot, but that's not a good shot. You want to shoot up and fall through, right? And the idea is the trajectory of the ball goes up and it drops through the basket. That's the idea. And if, you, if your focus is on the back side of the rim, right, then the idea is the ball falls right in front of that. That's, that's the way it works. And uh, if I'm missing a shot short and it's hitting the front of the rim, I know my focus is wrong. Right? If, if, if I, I'm shooting and it's hitting the front of the rim, I know, okay, I need to look at the back of the rim. So when I turn and I, I face the basket, I'm not looking at the whole backboard. I'm not looking at the whole orange thing called a rim. I'm looking at the back of that rim. I'm looking at a little spot that's directly across from me on the backside of the rim, the size of a quarter, let's say. That's all I'm looking at. Now, let's say I'm in a gym, and let's say there's thousands of people in the gym. There are people doing all kinds of stuff. There are people not paying attention to that game at all. They don't even know what's going on. They're eating popcorn. They're talking. You know, they're texting people. There's all kinds of stuff going on. And on the basketball court, I would never see it. I have no idea that somebody just spilled their popcorn in the third row. I have no clue that somebody just, you know, spilled a soda down someone's back up in the, up in the stands. I have no idea that somebody's not paying attention to my game. I, I didn't even know because I'm not watching them. I'm watching what's happening in front of me. I'm watching the ball. When it comes to me, I watch it. I catch it. Then I turn it. I'm going to go pass it to someone. Or I'm looking at the basket. I'm looking at the backside of the basket, the size of a quarter before I shoot. That's it. What I focus on determines. Now, let's just say I said, dude. Did you see, I'm, I'm playing the game, and I'm like, dude, did you see the guy spill popcorn in the third row? That was insane. You don't think that way, because if I, if I do that, I ain't catching the ball, and I'm not shooting the ball. Right? Now, think about life. We're living life. At the end of the day, if you're a follower of Christ, who are you supposed to follow? His name is Jesus, right? Okay, in case you didn't know the answer, just fill in the blank, Jesus. Right? Whatever question I ask you, you might just say Jesus today, probably is the right answer. Anyway, you follow Jesus, right? So you're following Jesus. Have you ever followed somebody through a crowd? Right? It's like, you know, like a, you know, the, a cardinal game lets out or whatever it is, and you start, everybody's trying to follow each other, and it's just people everywhere, right? You, you're, you may not be able to stay together, because you know how you hold on to people's coats or whatever, right? You do things like that. But you you're want to keep an eye on somebody, Right? And so if they're tall, you're looking for their head. They're little, you got to hold them by the hand or whatever it is. You're, you're, you're trying to keep your group together. You're not seeing the thousands of people around you. You're seeing the one person that you're trying to follow. Okay, we get so distracted by all the things around us. I mean, there's so many things going around us. There are so many distractions. And our job, if you're a follower of Christ, is to follow Jesus. That's your job. I don't want my kids to follow me or obey me as much as I want them to follow Jesus and obey him. So parents, we even teach this wrong a lot of times. Here's the deal. If your child will follow Jesus, if he'll obey Jesus, if he will uh, surrender what is just, whatever, all those kind of words to Jesus, then they'll obey you. That's how it works. And when they don't obey you, they'll know that they're wrong. And the Spirit of God will convict them. I mean, you know, we, may, we still, our kids still make mistakes. We still, you have to discipline all those kind of things. But the, but the real deal is if your kid's following Jesus, they'll be a better child. You know, so it's really important that they, they have to obey me. Well, I understand. I, I, understand I, I know what all that means. I get it. But at the end of the day, what that means is that they're not following Jesus too. Because this kid comes to church, I mean, they're following Christ. It just means they're coming to church. See, the most important thing a man can do is follow Jesus. He'll be a better husband. He'll be a better father. He'll be a better employee or employer. He'll be better. The most important thing a woman can do is follow Jesus. Because she'll be a better mom. She'll be a better, better wife. She'll be a better homemaker, employee, employer, whatever she may be. She'll be better. The same thing is true for a child. 
the most important thing a small child, a middle school or a high school or a college student, the most important thing they can do is make a decision to follow Jesus. Because if I'm following Jesus, other things come together. If I'm following Jesus, like John kept talking about his anger, right? Well, I'm sure his parents and him have had some have issues over anger, right? And they may not have been very successful. But if he's dealing with God, if the Holy Spirit's convicting him saying, John, your anger is way out of whack, brother. The parent doesn't have anything to say because God's already convicting him. Now his job then is to follow Christ or not follow Christ. His job is to surrender or not surrender. His job is he's going to grieve, and grieve the Holy Spirit and say, I'll be angry when I want to be, dadgummit. Or he can allow the Holy Spirit to convict him and he can choose repentance and change his mind and change his direction and change his purpose. See, we've got to, we've got to change the paradigm. Uh, the, we've got to change the, the, the circumstances we're in, the situation, and start saying, listen, Jesus is at the, at the top of the deal. It's all about Jesus. Everything's about Jesus. When my focus is on Jesus, my mission changes, my vision changes. My job is to focus on Jesus, not all the other distractions. The popcorn in the third row doesn't mean a hill of beans. My job is on this basketball court is to make a basket or whatever the thing is. My job as a father, my job as an employee or employer, my job as a husband, my job is to follow Jesus. That's my job. I don't care what it is you do. If you, know, if you, if you say, I know Christ my Savior, okay, you can be legalistic. That's not what we do. You can be in this middle ground I'm calling religious. It's just kind of a, I'm going through the motions and I'm checking off boxes and I'm being good people and I go to church and whatever. Or you can really have a relationship with him that transforms you. I mean, that's the, really the point. Not hearing stories like me telling you stories about what God does in my life, but you having your own stories about what God's doing in you and how he's stirring you and how he's transforming you. You being on your own adventures. Where it's like God's doing stuff in you that is, he's stretching you and he's doing stuff that's crazy and you love every second of it, even the hard parts, because you see what God's doing in you and you know it's because you have a relationship with him. And when someone talks to you about heaven and hell, you have zero question knowing you'll spend eternity with him in a place called heaven. Because you've seen his spirit operate in you so many times. You've seen him empower you and you, you've seen him give you peace and You've seen him help you walk through things that you thought will kill you. See, the, um, I, I, the title is Focus, Mission, and Vision. And the point is shifting your focus allows you to see things differently. What, one of the questions of that is, is whose mission am I even on? Excuse me, I'm a, my name's Tim. I'm pastor of a church. Have us be a great church. We've seen God do a lot of things in our church. I'm going on and on, right? Okay. Whose mission am I on? I mean, I could be a pastor of a church and have my own mission. I mean, that's one of the things people always say about pastors. If you're a pastor of a growing church, you will be criticized. You'll be called all kinds of things. You know what they'll say about you. That's, just, that's routine across the world. That's what people do. It's really not what people do. It's what the enemy does. It's spiritual warfare, and Satan is always there to whisper. That's just what happens. But there are pastors on their own mission. I mean, I just want a job. If I just want a job, if my mission is to keep a job, then I don't want to rock any boats. I'll play political games. I just want to keep people happy. I don't want to, you know, I want to, I want to make sure finances come in so I can pay the bills or whatever it is. If I, my mission is not to have a job, my mission is to follow Jesus, then I'm willing to take risk and I'm, and I'm willing to follow him regardless of how somebody feels about it, even if they get a little upset, even if they leave the church. I mean, if, if I had chosen to want to keep a job, 17 years ago, our church would still be running 90 people, or maybe it's 150 people, but we still would be small because that was not, reaching people was not what we wanted to do. 
Changing was not what we wanted to do. Having new people come to our church and losing control and power is not what we wanted to do. So it's, it's all based on what is my mission? Why, why am I, is it my mission or is it God's mission? What I focus on gets done. If all I want to focus on is making sure you're really happy, I, I, you know, I'm going to come, I'm going I'm to make sure you're happy. I want to be with you. I want to spend time with you. I want to talk to you. I want to understand what you're, you know, well, this makes you uncomfortable. This makes you upset or this may makes you may want to not start giving, you may quit giving money if I do that or I have to worry about those things. If what I'm going to do is follow Jesus, the distractions go away. I mean, I don't mean this ugly. I'm just saying for me, I, you're, you're in the stands and you're eating popcorn. I'm on the court and I'm playing. And when God gives me the ball, I'm trying to find the rim to score. The only one I'm following is Jesus. If I'm walking through the crowd, I'm looking at the head of Jesus, right? I'm, I'm just, okay, I'm, I'm just watching him. It, it, whatever's behind me is behind me. Whoever's around me is behind me. I'm just trying to, as I go through the crowd, I'm just trying to follow Jesus. And wherever he's at, that's where I'm gonna go. I'm gonna keep following him. And the rest of you, I hope come along with us, right? Okay, now let's get all the way from me. Let's talk about you. Whose mission are you on? Because we, what we, pastors, clergy, culture, whatever it is, the church, whatever it is, they really mess things up. Okay, Jesus died on a cross. He became the high priest. Before Jesus, you came to a priest to get, um, have to talk to God, to get forgiveness, all these other kind of things. You had to get access to a person to get to God. That is no longer true, right? So when you put a pastor, a priest, a whatever on a pedestal, that's wrong. They're not perfect. They're all flawed. Every one of us are sinners saved by grace or we're, we're sinners who's not saved by grace. We're just something else. And the point is, is that nobody's different. The pastor of the biggest churches in America is no bigger than you are. The person who God does all kinds of stuff through is no different than you are. We're just people. We're all in need of a savior and we all are saved by God's grace toward us and none of us are good enough and none of us will ever earn God's love and God's forgiveness. That's never gonna happen. Okay. So you don't have to do anything to have access to God. You have it. <clears throat> Jesus, when he died going to heaven, uh, before that, he'd say, you know, he would tell his disciples stuff. And then after he comes, after he, well, after he died, he came back on the earth for 40 days and he gave what we call these great commissions where they, you know, used Matthew 28, you know, go you therefore in all the world, preach and teach and baptize and making disciples. Where they use, you know, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that uh, you will see the Holy Spirit. You will have power when you see the Holy Spirit to be my witnesses. No matter how you want to look at it, basically, it's an external focus that God's call for our lives to be external, not internal. That it's about his mission, not our mission. And that's our job, okay? And um, um, the pastor of the church um, might be the leader of an organization we call a church. But the pastor of a church... Um, is under no, okay. you're under the same, the person who sits in the chair is under the same obligation to the mission, the, the great commission as the person on the stage. They're all the same. Followers of Christ are followers of Christ. As it relates to a job or as it relates to an organizational structure, we have an organizational structure and I'm in a certain role in the organizational structure and some of you may not be there. Okay? And you say, well, I'm the 13 year old girl. And well, you're, you're not even on the organizational chart. Okay, but as it comes to a, fo a follower of Christ, the 13-year-old girl is equal to Tim as it relates to a follower of Christ. Does that make sense to everybody? Yes? Campuses, does that make sense to you guys? We're all equal. So one of the lies is, well, the church just wants your money. Well, the pastor just wants to be bigger. Listen, I'm not saying that's not true for some places. I don't, okay, whatever, I don't know. But that's not true here. And it should never be true. Our job is to go ye therefore into all the world, begin with our Jerusalem, our Jerusalem of Judea, Samaria, the of the earth, that when the Holy Spirit comes upon us, Jesus himself said, when the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, you're gonna be my witnesses. When the, the, Jesus would say, when the Holy Spirit lives inside of you, he will speak to you and through you about me. He will teach you the things that I have taught, through, I, I've taught and he will use you, he will be my witness. He will, he will speak through you to others. That's how it's gonna work. That's the mission. 
And I don't care if you're the pastor of the church or you're the 13-year-old girl in middle school. It doesn't matter what we're talking about. That's for everyone. If you know Jesus, you got two choices. Live in some version of religion or walk in a relationship with him where you actually follow him. That if he takes steps that way, you take steps that way. If he stands still, you stand still. If he comes to take steps this way, you take steps this way. That's what it means to follow Christ. Then we talk about taking the next step. What is God stirring you to do right now? That's the deal. And what happens is, is the, the question, I know, I, by the way, for those who are nervous, I got, two, I got two nervous groups right now. I got the nervous group and goes, okay, surely he's not going to finish this outline. <laughs> and I got the nervous group that says, there are going to be so many blanks on this that I have not filled in. What do I do? <laughs> okay, no, I'm not going to finish the outline and I'll come back next week. Okay, so just chill. Okay. <laughs> Whew, got that off the table. Now, so here's how, listen to me. Here's how I want us to wrap up. Right now, every one of us are either focused on the mission of Jesus or some version of our own mission. Every one of us. I mean, maybe my mission is just be comfortable. I can't be comfortable and follow Jesus at the same time. Sometimes those will coexist, you know what I'm saying? But there'll always be the time when Jesus says, no, we're stepping here. Like, hey, dude, I ain't going with you. Okay? And what many of us tend to do is we tend to stand still, and when our mission aligns with Jesus, we're all good with that. When our mission doesn't align with Jesus, eh, we're not, so, not going to follow. And somehow we think it's okay. I want you to understand it's not okay. I mean, I love you, God loves you, but you remember, love's not a compliment, right? Unconditional love is not really a compliment. I'd rather God to like me than love me. Big, different message. So here's the deal. Right now, are you engaged with the mission that God has for you? Or are you really on your own mission? Do what you want to do when you want to do it how you want to do it. Maybe it's, I'm just building my business, build my business, build my business, build my business. Maybe it is, uh, I'm just trying to be a parent, be a parent, be a parent. I'm trying to take care of all my toys I've bought and my properties, and I just want to live my life. I, I just want to go to church. I'm not being ugly. I need you to understand, if all you want to do is come to church for an hour and a half on one time a week, and have no engagement with God down the course of your week, I'm just telling you you're doing something wrong. That's not how you grow and develop as a follower of Christ. It doesn't work that way. It never has. I, don't, I want to go to church on Sunday morning. I want to be a part of a large crowd, but I never want to get on the field and play. I never want to be a part of a small group. I never want to volunteer. I never want to give financially. I never want to really change. I just want to go to church. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to walk in real fast. I'm going to walk out real fast. I'm done. <laughs> Did my work for the day. I'm just telling you, that's not how it's supposed to be. I am not a used car salesman trying to sell you a used car. I am a sinner saved by grace just like you. I have chosen to also be a follower of Jesus. I want to tell you what it's like to follow him. And I hope that you make a choice for yourself to be a follower of Jesus, not a setter who just listens. Not someone who just sets and attends, but someone who actually follows him. Who recognizes that sometimes on a Thursday afternoon, sometimes on a Tuesday morning, that God just stirs you because he wants time with you. Because he loves you. And he knows you're going to say yes. See, I don't want to be the guy who God knows I'm going to say no. I don't want to be the guy who God knows I'm going to ignore him. I want to be the guy that God always knows I will say yes. Because I know the benefits that come with that. Is God going to ask me to do something? Yeah, he will. But man, he's going to give me peace. He's going to give me joy. He's going to give me patience. He's going to give me, I can just go through the list of stuff. 
He will empower me. I'll be able to see. I'll have a vantage point to be able to see the activity of God that I would never be able to see if I just chose to stay in some version of religion. I'm going to follow him. I want you to do the same. We'll pick up there next week. I want you to be processing whose mission are you really on? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. Um, God, uh, I, I look back and it's, it, 2017 was a great year. I'm filled with hope for 2018. But God, what I know is that I, I just believe you want to take us as a church to different places. People talk about new levels and all that kind of stuff. God, I, whatever that means. What I know is I believe that you want to change hearts. The individuals, it's not what I say from the stage, it's not how big a church gets or that kind of stuff. But God, I believe that an individual's heart is where transformation takes place and where you're gonna make changes that transform how we do church, what we see you do, our level of faith, the things that we see you accomplish in our ministries. And Father, I, I just pray that some of the stories I told today or the illustrations or the scriptures or the guy, I didn't even finish the scripture. God, I just pray that you stir, that you speak, and that we recognize that right now, in many of our cases, right now, you're stirring us to respond, and we're going to say yes, or we're going to say no, or we're going to ignore you. God, thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's